Welcome to the Dr. Lori Morris podcast, where she interviews experts in health and science, sharing their expertise so you can live your healthiest life. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by Fit Vegan Coaching, the world's leading whole food plant-based body recomposition program for Gen X and baby boomers. Founded by Maxime, whose personal journey began after losing his ex fiance to breast cancer, Fit Vegan Coaching is on a mission to disease-proof the world through the transformative power of plant-based eating and fitness. This program is a Rolls Royce of plant-based coaching, offering all-inclusive services, personalized plans, world-class accountability, lifelong support, and more. Say goodbye to the yo-yo dieting and embrace a lasting transformation that will rev up your metabolism even post-transformation. Ready to take charge of your health and vitality? Head over to fitvegan.ca, that's fitvegan.ca, and mention Dr. Lori for exclusive bonus savings when you sign up. Don't miss this opportunity to join the movement towards a healthier, fitter, and more vibrant you. Are you tired of compromising between convenience and healthy eating? Look no further. Introducing Whole Harvest, your ultimate solution for wholesome plant-based meals. Whole Harvest is redefining the way you eat. Their meals are not only delicious, but also 100% whole food plant-based without any compromise. Whole Harvest takes pride in their approach. There's no oils, no added sugars, and low sodium. Plus, they have SOS free menu items available. I recommend Whole Harvest to my patients. They need convenient and compliant meals that can be delivered to their home. At Whole Harvest, you can reimagine your favorite dishes with a plant-based flair and enjoy menu items like the All-American Burger, Harvest Lasagna, and Soba Kimchi Bowl. Whole Harvest meals are chef-crafted and made with high-quality ingredients, delivered straight to your door. And guess what? They ship nationwide, so you can enjoy whole food, plant-based meals no matter where you are. And here's an exclusive offer just for our podcast listeners. Use the discount code PLANTS30 to receive $30 off your first order. Visit wholeharvest.com and place your order today. Again, that's wholeharvest.com. Your journey to delicious whole food plant-based eating starts here. This episode of the podcast is proudly sponsored by The Healing Kitchen, your path to vibrant health. Immerse yourself in the transformative program guided by the combined expertise of myself, Dr. Lori Marbus, and Chef Brittany Giroudi, who has lost 70 pounds on a whole food plant-based diet. Here's what's in store for you. Virtual weekly sessions. Engage in an immersive 60-minute virtual session every single week, where you'll delve into the world of wholesome plant-based goodness right from your own kitchen. Cooking with Brittany the first half hour. Unleash your inner chef as you're captivated by Chef Brittany Giroudi's culinary mastery that will delight your taste buds and nourish your body. Medical Q&A with Dr. Lori the last half hour. Prioritize your well-being during the second half hour. I will personally address your medical inquiries, providing evidence-based insights and personalized advice, empowering you to make informed choices for your health. So join us on the Healing Kitchen to help you step into a healthier and most vibrant future. Welcome to the podcast. I'm Dr. Lori Marvis, and I'm super excited to actually just welcome some neighbors. They're just down the road a few minutes. And uh, since we're in California, I've got to see you guys a little bit, but James and Dahlia Mirren, these are integrative plant-based dietitians, really excited about all the things you're going to learn today. So welcome to the show. Thank, Thank you. you. We're excited. Oh, yeah, Lori, we love, we love having you as our neighbor. You're local now. It's great. <laughs> exactly. I know you guys have like kept this little gym as a hidden secret. I feel it's a great place to live. <laughs> yeah, we love we, it. We've been to the Salt Creek Beach since you told mm -hmm. us last time. Oh my goodness, we've been back like four times already. It's great. Such a nice walk, a little picnic area. Yeah, so much to do. I know. I'm so grateful for just where we live. We're like we live where people vacation, and <laughs> we do not take it for granted. <laughs> exactly. So explore your 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 neighboring uh, beaches and the parks. There's so much more to go. But anyway, as we're developing some uh, people who may be listening to this one's a little bit chillier, you know, they're going to be wishing they were in Southern California. But <laughs> I want to dive into what you guys do and you focus in on gut health. So can you share with us a little bit of like what your specialty is and kind of like 
your greatest number of patients and we can dive into how you help these folks. Yeah. So, you know, we've been dietitians now for 10 years. And I think as you're starting out, you kind of play around in different areas with what you think you want to really specialize in. And, you know, we've had both unique backgrounds. I know I started inpatient clinical because I thought I wanted to be a renal dietitian at first. And that I realized was not for me. I, I was working really hard towards getting my certification as a renal dietitian, but I realized I I don't actually want to work with a renal population. To me, it was quite depressing. I just liked that they had continuity of care. These people would come in several times a week because they had to for their dialysis. But I realized I wanted outpatient care. I really wanted to connect with people on that aspect. And so I worked in an outpatient clinic. I worked for a pediatrician for a few years. Mm -hmm. And then I was trained in more integrative and functional nutrition because I was more interested in integrative nutrition for myself. And that's when I really learned all disease begins in the gut, right? Hippocrates said that so long ago, but it really kept pointing back to the gut, the gut, the gut for autoimmune disease, for cardiovascular conditions, for metabolic conditions. If the gut wasn't right, none of that would be optimally functioning. And so that just landed me into this niche of supporting people with all things gut health, but really with a particular interest in irritable bowel syndrome and a subset of irritable bowel syndrome called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or microbial overgrowth or fungal overgrowth. Uh, really just deep dysbiosis that unfortunately we're seeing more and more and more, especially in our newest generations, but also, you know, those of us born in the seventies, eighties, nineties, we were the antibiotic kids. And so we're really starting to see a lot of us, unfortunately have gut imbalance as a result of that. So that has just been my passion for the past six, seven years. And working with this population has been such a passion project of mine. And then to add to that really quickly, then creating an environment, an ecosystem where people can come mm-hmm. and work with dietitians who truly understand the integrative nature. Because I think really any health professional who's taking a deep dive, who really has a passion, you become integrative by nature. You understand your headache is not unrelated to your gut. Your diabetes isn't unrelated to your gut. Your Even your arthritis, right? We're finding out and, and autoimmune conditions, you know, the list goes on and on goes back to your gut. So you realize, oh, there's different areas, but it's still one body. So with that, that we then created our private practice and added on other dietitians to help nurture this ecosystem and a patient population that really comes in. And we're, we're not just treating surface level symptoms. We're going, why are those symptoms there? What happened integrating this exposome, as the research calls it, which is trauma and stress and where you live and where you work and what you eat and all these different factors, but really trying to make it simplified a bit and and kind of hone in on your path and where to start in all of that. So it's not so overwhelming. (laughs) No, I think you're right. Because everything you just mentioned, I think the one thing that we can probably all attest to with all the patients is the overwhelm and -hmm. not knowing where to start because And then especially the gut, because there can be so many different symptoms and people have been told different things and they're given different medications. And and it's just, it's an overwhelming experience. So if someone wanted to work with you, how do you even begin to, you know, I guess, you know, unwrap the present of what their, their problem is, you know, peel back the onion layers and really determine one, what the problem is, but two, how do you start to heal? And that's such a good question because sometimes, you know, we have people with a smaller onion than others, right? They don't have quite as many layers wrapped up, but I often get those patients who are like, well, I have out of control type two diabetes, Mm -hmm. but the way that I'm supposed to be eating for my diabetes does not agree with my gut. I can't tolerate those foods. I can't eat all those non-starchy vegetables. I can't digest them. They really hurt my stomach. So we always start there. And the first question I start every single new patient visit with is tell me your health story. I always want to hear about what is your timeline of events of diagnoses, injuries, illnesses, stressful events in your life, different ways of eating that you've had, any exposure to anything. Yeah. And your exposome, whether that was medications, whether that was mold, whether that was trauma, um, how were you born? What did that look like? What did your first thousand days of life look like? Because we do know studies show that builds the foundation of the gut microbiome. Did your mom have gut issues when she was pregnant with you? 
Were you colicky as a baby? Were you born vaginally? Were you breastfed? So we really get in deep because all of these events really play into one another. And it's so often that as we're putting this timeline together, it's their very first time doing that. I don't think many people have sat down and written out their health story and their health journey. And then we start to put events together. I, yesterday, I was speaking with a patient who was saying, I don't know why two years ago, I already was having IBS, but it just got really bad. And then we realized, well, you had surgery and they gave you IV antibiotics. And I think that that led you to even deeper gut symptoms. And so it can be just nice to really lay out that story, write your timeline and really understand what your biggest triggers are. Because I think sometimes people think, well, it was this one thing that really did it for me without realizing maybe other things played into it. And there are other things that we really want to foster and pay attention to. And I think with that starting point, just to add is, is the goal is to help you with your digestion. Cause really that's the root, right? If you're, if your microbiome is there to help you properly break down your nutrients and you're able to properly absorb, that is, that is the nexus, right? Like that is a, a huge, huge part of it. But another part of that is, yeah, there's just overwhelm, right? So we've created and, and facilitated a structure where you can house all your information with us, right? Like we can accept faxes and emails from other doctors and house all of your past labs and your invoices and everything is there at your fingertips in the portal where you can make appointments, you can see everything. And it's almost like a, a sigh of relief of like, oh, I have all my encounter visits and my notes and my summaries and my handouts and all the resources are there in one portal secure and that's a huge part of starting where you can kind of just organize in a way and really get set and go, oh, cool. Anytime I need to come back and look or add or organize, it's all there. So that's a big part of it that I think not enough health professionals talk about is how things are organized and that in and of itself, helping patients just feel comfortable and ready to then continue on their health journey. But yeah. No, I guess that exactly right. It's funny because you'll, I have patients who will say the same thing. Well, can you log into this for me? And I have this where I was like, no, actually, I need you to go <laughs> gather that and bring it to me. I have a portal as well and the EHR and really focus in yeah. on the more pertinent things. So then let's say you're getting this timeline and you're starting to see some problems and some connections. How do you determine it's IBS or SIBO or whatever? Like, how do you get down to the granular diagnosis and what are those? Are there tests or what do you recommend? Mm -hmm. I think that we're seeing IBS so prevalent prevalent in our society because it really is just a a um, culmination of different symptoms. And we do know about 10 to 15 percent of the U.S. population has IBS because it really just means more than a few times in a month's period, you've had abdominal pain change in bowel habits. Um, and so many of us experience that, right? I think that's the number one reason why people go see a gastroenterologist. GI issues are one of the number one reasons people go to the hospital. They're one of the number one reasons people see their PCP. Um, so it's kind of just this random different collection of symptoms that anyone can usually say yes to for the most part. Um, but I think what people don't realize is, yes, you could have your gut that feels a little irritable, if you will, a couple of days a month where you might have some pain. You might have a change in bowel movements, whether that's diarrhea, constipation, alternating diarrhea and constipation. And then your primary provider or your gastroenterologist would then diagnose you with something like IBS. And we always like to identify why do you have these symptoms? I think now we're starting to really acknowledge, okay, studies show 14 to 70, 70% 70 of IBS can actually be SIBO as some studies have revealed. And so do you have an overabundance of microbes in a place they don't belong? Do you have imbalance of anti-inflammatory gut bugs and inflammatory gut bugs? That's called dysbiosis. When things are out of balance, are you not in that eubiosis, that balance? Is it your gut barrier where maybe you have some intestinal hyperpermeability or is it your motility? Do you have nerve dysfunction? Are your pelvic floor muscles functioning as they should? Do you have any strictures or adhesions or any other type of tissue that is affecting the way that those muscles in and around your GI tract are moving? That's always so important to identify. Okay, do you have IBS, which is the overarching umbrella? Underneath that umbrella of IBS, do you have SIBO or some other type of 
bacterial, microbial, fungal overgrowth? And how can we identify why you got there? Because I think it's always nice when people can name something. They can say, I have IBS, I have SIBO. I always want to know why. Why do you have that? What facet of your gut needs a little bit of love and a little bit of extra attention? So that way we can really pour into that. And my goal is always to have people say, I used to have IBS. I used to have SIBO because I don't believe it needs to be a lifelong diagnosis unless it is something that is a little bit more perpetual. Um, But I feel like for so many people, they accept that and they just accommodate their lives around this diagnosis. Oh, I'm not going to eat all those foods. I'm going to avoid all those different types of vegetables. I'm not going to eat those fruits. I'm not going to go out with people. I have so many patients tell me I don't go out at night because by nighttime, my clothes don't fit me well. And I feel really uncomfortable going out with people like that. So they're living their lives around this diagnosis and don't always have the right help to really, like you mentioned, peel back those layers of the onion and try to identify what worked for you, what didn't work for you. I have so many patients who come to me and they say, I tried the low FODMAP diet, which stands for fermentable, basically fermentable carbohydrates, um, different types of fibers and sugars like oligosaccharides, disaccharides, monosaccharides, polyols. Um, but they'll try it because that's the number one diet that's recommended for IBS or even for SIBO. And they'll say, but it didn't work for me. I tried it two different times, three different times. I used the apps. It didn't work for me. And again, just like with IBS really being predominantly SIBO a lot of the times with low FODMAP studies do show it works for 50 to 80% of patients who try it. But what about the other 20 to 50% of people? Or do we just kind of throw our hands up at them? Um, or do we try to help them identify, okay, maybe it didn't work for you because actually you have a different type of microbiome. You have an overabundance of these sulfur reducing bacteria in your gut. And it doesn't matter really if you eat FODMAPs, the sulfur is what's really bothering you. So let's try to help you balance that. Maybe you have fungal overgrowth, or maybe you have very permeable gut barrier, a very leaky gut, and you now have histamine intolerance. Maybe that's why low FODMAP didn't really work for you because your other symptoms were a little bit more overarching than some fermentation going on. So I always think it's so, so, so important to, like you said, peel back those layers of the onion, not settle for, I don't know, your bowels are irritable go on with your life and accommodate this diagnosis. I think there's so much power that we have. And and I think to just give an analogy, because that, that could be a lot, especially for the average person. And a quick analogy is just like a factory. You're, you're making something in the factory. And I think it's like a, you're, you're making a car and you may just think, I'm going to go buy a car. And we all kind of take it for granted. I know I do. Like, I'm going to go drive in my car, but not knowing the battery and the hybrid motor and all the doors and knobs and nuts and screws. So that is food, right? You're like, I'm going to eat food, but really getting into the nitty gritty of there's histamines in your food and there's viruses and there's fungi and we have parasites naturally, commensal parasites. I know parasites, that could be a whole nother talk in and of itself, but you know, there's all these elements in our food that we don't really think about, but we do start to think about it when we have this dysbiosis. And going back to the factory, it would be like a third of your workers or fourth of your workers, or for some people, it's most of their workers, aka these microbes have kind of taken a sick day. So now you're trying, you're in this factory and you're trying to build the car, but you have, you know, a a 10th of your workers there and they're just barely hanging on and the cars coming out are just not working right. And they're barely coming off the, the line and customers aren't happy. And that's a great analogy for the gut where you're trying to digest this food, but maybe you're seeing whole food in your stool. You're getting all these symptoms from eczema all the way to, you know, to severe SIBO, gas and bloating. And I mean, the list can go on and on hives and post-nasal drip. And we've had patients who are bedridden and really can't function properly. And it's because you are not building these nutrients as well as breaking down and absorbing nutrients. But part of the microbiome is to help make postbiotics, which are beneficial nu- nutrients that then get used throughout the body, aka that car, that product, and you're not able to produce that. So really, this is a story of our, our society right now, at least from the USDA data, 97% of Americans 
are not intaking that fiber. Mm -hmm. And let alone what this translates to is really a postbiotic deficiency, mm -hmm. aka a, a short chain fatty acid deficiency. You are not using that fiber from these this beautiful array of plants to feed your microbes so they can give you these products and gifts. And now we're, that's translated into diabetes epidemic, autoimmune epidemic, obesity epidemic, you know, we translate it into this disease, but it really starts with what you're eating and how your gut is processing that. So, and that's where Dahlia is specialty. And she's amazing at this, getting into the weeds of that. And everyone's slightly different, right? And what their factory looks like and which workers out on sick leave, right? And we got to bring those workers back, right? So, yeah. Yeah, so that I think that's a great segue into, okay, now we understand kind of what onion we're dealing with and the severity of it or how big it is. How do you go about diagnosing? Like what tools do you utilize mm -hmm. to get to give you the data to know where even where to start with treatment? So one of my favorite ways to have patients understand if they do have SIBO in particular is a breath test. So they can perform either an in-office at their gastroenterologist's office or an at-home breath test. And it, these tests are two to three hours. And they're basically spending that time blowing air into these bags. And then the lab is gonna measure how much hydrogen, methane, or hydrogen sulfide gas is being produced by these different microbes. They all live in us, right? We have these hydrogen, methane, and hydrogen sulfide producers living in us, but they should only be making a certain amount of gas. If the amount of gas is in excess of that, then we can assume, okay, you might have an overabundance, an overgrowth of some of these different things. I think with fungal overgrowth, it can be a little bit more difficult to diagnose. Your best bet is to get an amazing gastroenterologist who can perform a small bowel aspirate where they take a small sample of fluid from the small intestine, and then they culture that for yeast. It's very rare to find a person who offers that. And so there are certain urine metabolite tests that can test for activity of yeast. Um, so some one that I sometimes will look at is something called D-arabinitol, which is a postbiotic byproduct of yeast fermentation. So if somebody has a really high overabundance of D-arabinitol production, they have yeast symptoms like oral thrush, vaginal yeast infections, athlete's foot, d really severe dandruff, um, and some of the other telltale yeast symptoms, then that is when you can have them confirm with their care team that they do in fact have this fungal overgrowth. So lots of different options available, but I would say at-home breath testing is really nice and reliable. And now actually I've been recommending more frequently a cool little device that recently came out. We're not affiliated with them, but I just recommend it. It's called a food marble. And mm -hmm. patients can utilize this little device that fits into their pocket or purse to measure their hydrogen and methane levels after every single meal, because these breath tests are nice, but they're expensive, right? Nobody wants to spend two to $400 every time they need to get tested. But this little device, if you know you have hydrogen or methane overgrowth, that can be helpful for you to test three times a day, four times a day if you wanted to. And that can give you an idea of where do I stand? What is what I'm working on with my dietitian, my gastroenterologist, my care team? Is it working? And are my levels reducing? Are they going up? Are there certain foods that really trigger an increased level of gas? So there are different options out there for, you know, different people's access to different healthcare providers and their different needs. Mm. So how reliable would you say the SIBO breath tests are? Like what's the percentage? And if um, mm -hmm. someone is still presenting classically clinically with symptoms, but their breath test, let's say was negative, what do you do in those type of cases? Yeah, and that can happen. So the sensitivity and specificity is pretty high on the SIBO breath tests. I think uh, both are around 97 to 98%. We use one called TrioSmart. That's the lab that we like to use in our practice, but high sensitivity, high specificity. Um, this lab was actually founded by one of the top SIBO researchers in the world, Dr. Pimentel, Mark Pimentel. Um, and so they, day in and day out, do different SIBO research. And so their, that SIBO breath test is highly accurate, but there's always room for user error, right? Because the patient themselves needs to prepare in a specific way. Um, if they maybe didn't do the proper prep in advance, that's going to skew the test results. Or if a little bit of room air gets into the bag that they're blowing into, that can skew the results as well. So 
we're human. There's always room for human error, um, but there are, I would say, pretty accurate. And I like the tests, especially that are going to give you maybe a two and a half to three hour picture, because by about 90 minutes, an hour and a half, the substrate that the patient used, whether that's lactulose or glucose, so the patient's usually in their little breath test kit, they get a little container of some type of fermentable sugar to swallow. Um, I prefer using glucose because the lactulose has lactose in it, um, but patients are given either or by their care team, they swallow it. And by about 90 minutes, um, that has been completely passed through the small intestine. And then it moves into the large intestine. So I like when the tests are a little bit longer because then you can see, is it now out of their small intestine but it's still in their large intestine because you can still have overgrowth and overabundance there. Um, and I want to say looking at the totality of symptoms as well, like yeah. a breath test is a piece of the puzzle, but we're looking, and this is where Dahlia and our other dietitian, Rachel, are, are really looking at that health story, looking at mm -hmm. the symptoms, looking at, at that trend in the past medical history, as well as the breath test and even other tests. Yeah. So we'll ask patients right. every visit. I'm going to show you the Bristol stool chart, point out your stool type recently. Right. Are, are your stools falling apart? Are they sticky like peanut butter when you wipe? What percentage are complete? Tell me about your bloat. Let's quantify your bloat. Let's quantify your gas. What's the smell of your gas? Where do you have pain? So uh, I always say papers and tests are helpful, but the person is a lot more important because sometimes tests come back perfect. And you know, all patients know this, right? Where they, so, someone sits there and looks at you and says, oh, no, everything's fine. On paper, you look great. You're good. But you have all these symptoms. So it's so important to have a care team who actually prioritizes you and what you're telling them. And yes, knows how to use some of these fancy tests and tools, but prioritizes you as a person and really listens to what you're telling them. No, that's great. And I guess before we get into like treatment of SIBO and kind of your care package, how you work that is, um, a lot of people will come in with like stool tests. They'll come in with these mm -hmm. things. And I'm just curious, how accurate do you feel those are? And do you, are they actionable? Cause I have not found them to be super helpful, but that's just my own experience. I'm by no means an expert, but I'd love to hear your opinion. I think we're getting closer, but I don't think the the science is there yet, right? We yeah. don't quite have the technology to fully analyze these stool samples. Um, you know, we just recently in the past several years mapped out the human microbiome. So I don't feel like we know enough to really be applying these stool tests. Mm -hmm. I would say it's very rare that I might recommend one only if it's like, we've tried everything and you're just not responding. That's a last resort. But if we don't know that they're accurate, we know that the data is not quite there yet. They are so expensive and unpleasant to perform, right? Who wants to sit there and spatula their stool into little uh, containers? Um, I, I don't think it's a, a great tool to be utilizing to really tell somebody about their microbiome because things change. Mm -hmm. And those stool tests also, we don't know what part of the colon that stool came from. Mm. That could only be the distal colon, the end of the colon. We don't know how the, how different that could be from the proximal colon, the start of the colon. Your microbiome can differ heavily. You don't know how much that meal you ate the day before could influence that or your stress level. So I would say I agree with you where patients often bring them to me. And so I've learned to kind of interpret them over the years, but it's an extreme rarity where I'm the one who would recommend a stool test like that. Yeah. And keep in mind, and we're, and we're really speaking on small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. The, again, these stool tests are not measuring what's mm -hmm. really happening in the small intestine, right? Like Dolly mentioned, it's in the colon yeah. and really I liken it to the ocean. Like we have this idea of the ocean, but we really don't know the ocean, right? It's like, it's like, yeah, it's kind of explored, but most of it's not, right? And so it's like, we overall get it. We can surf and bodyboard and we can go on a boat and there's people that dive and all, but have you really explored the ocean? The answer is no. And I feel like that's kind of, that's kind of the microbiome where we're, we're barely understanding the virome, which viruses outnumber bacteria. And we thought bacteria were like, I mean, we're talking about trillions. So with viruses, we're talking 
10 to the exponential number, that's insane, right? So um, we're really understanding the parasitome and and just and then we mingle them all together. Mm -hmm. And then there's viruses for bacteria. And then people don't realize there's viruses in our food that commingle with the viruses for the bacteria. And it's just this ocean of intermingling species of all shapes and sizes. So it's it's really complex. And I think that I often see patients who have very well-meaning practitioners order these tests for them, but if they aren't really well-versed in how to interpret them, they'll see something like H. pylori and mm -hmm. they'll treat this person with a really aggressive treatment for H. pylori. Well, if it was never virulent and if it wasn't an active species of H. pylori, it probably wasn't affecting the person and it probably wasn't causing any symptoms for them. So a large percentage of people have asymptomatic H. pylori. You shouldn't be intervening on everything that you see on the test because again, then you're treating a paper, not a person. Mm -hmm. So I think people need to be just really careful, especially because now people can order these tests at home and you can go to the grocery store or go on Amazon and buy really heavy duty antiparasitics or antimicrobials and unfortunately, I think people get themselves sometimes into situations they never intended to, where they thought, oh, I'm just going to do a full moon parasite cleanse. And then three years later, they've had debilitating gut issues ever since. So I think it's always so important to really ask yourself, do I actually have symptoms that would correlate with having a parasite overgrowth? Or am I just bloated sometimes because I'm going out to eat frequently or I'm eating too quickly, or maybe I need to pull dairy from my diet, something like that. Um, so it's always nice to get that other person's opinion who can tell you, okay, let's pump the brakes a little bit. I don't think we need to be quite as aggressive or, okay, this, we should explore a little bit more. Your fecal calprotectin is elevated. seems mm -hmm. like you have inflammation in your colon. Let's verify that, that that's still going on. And if you need to, let's go get a colonoscopy or something to really verify this and, and then intervene if appropriate. And we want to be very vocal and we want to share this as much as possible of, of really helping people to not continue to blame the food, blame mm -hmm. the microbe. It is it is the totality of the environment, right? And so we're, we're so quick to blame the broccoli and blame the beans and blame the grains. And then even from our microbiome standpoint, we're so quick to, it's the parasites. Oh, candida's evil. Oh, H. pylori is bad. And it's like, these guys are here to help you. It's mm -hmm. more so what's the context of your environment? Because I, I, I you know, I don't think there's many rats fans right who loves rats and oh i want a pet rat and they're so cute and cuddly you know but they're necessary for our environment just mm -hmm. because you don't like them doesn't mean we should kill all the rats mm -hmm. but when you put it in a bad environment if you're inviting them into your home and you have food everywhere and you're getting lots of rats that's not ideal either but that doesn't mean we should kill all the rats right so it's it's very much that ecosystem analogy of going just because there's rats or there's hyenas or there's spiders or whatever animal you dislike, that doesn't mean we should get rid of them all. It's what is the context? What is the environment that is making this animal, this opportunist, just kind of the population explode? And then where are you inviting them? Are, the, are there tons of spiders in your home? Yeah, that's not good. Let's let's put them back outside, right? Let's put them where they need to be and find that that rebalance. What we call in the gut, it's eubiosis. Mm. Well, so many of us are in this dysbiosis. Mm. And instead of understanding the context and the environment, we're going, oh, we're in dysbiosis. Let's kill all of them because they're they're bad. This food's bad. The microbes are bad. It's like, no, why are you in dysbiosis? That is the key. Mm. No, that makes a lot of sense. So Let's go to the dysbiosis of SIBO. What is a typical treatment protocol or what do you decide how to treat it? Mm -hmm. So once you've really determined that you do have an overabundance, then we always like to assess, okay, what are your symptoms telling us? Who do we need to try to, yeah, maybe shoo outside a little bit? And then who do we need to nurture and feed so that way they naturally keep those other ones in check? With yeast overgrowth, a lot of the times what we find is yeast are opportunists. So they will overgrow. A lot of the times it comes about when there's not enough of that healthy acidic bacteria, like lactic acid bacteria and other types of acidic bacteria to just keep them in check. Yeast are not bad inherently. They're a natural part of our flora. But did it happen that you took several, you had to take several courses of oral antibiotics 
time after time, you were very stressed. And maybe because you were very stressed, maybe you weren't cooking as frequently at home and you were going out to eat highly processed, highly refined foods a lot. And those yeast took it up advantage of that opportunity. And then they became overabundant. If that's the case, let's maybe gently encourage them to decrease a little bit. And I don't like to use extreme measures. So even with a yeast overgrowth, a lot of my patients will say, oh, do I have to do a candida diet? Because I worked with another practitioner and they told me I couldn't eat any grains. I couldn't eat any fruit. I couldn't eat any carbs because it was all going to feed the yeast. I've never seen that to work because even if you do starve out the yeast, you will starve out those great healthy species that are going to then keep the yeast down. So you're just going to perpetually be in this cycle. So I always say, maybe let's just not add more fuel to the fire. Maybe let's not eat nutritional yeast for a little bit. And maybe let's avoid bread with yeast in it. And maybe let's decrease mushrooms a little bit for a, a little period of time. If we need to use a couple of little gentle antifungal um, modalities, then great. If that's a prescription antifungal, like a diflucan or fluconazole, ask your care team for that. If that's something herbal that we can utilize, let's try that. And then let's make sure that we're eating probiotic foods so that way we get those lactic acid bacteria back. Let's get those bifidobacteria back. So the yeast don't just come back and find, oh, the situation's right for me again. They're not paying attention. Let me move back in. So whether that is for yeast overgrowth, bacterial overgrowth, it is, you know, trying to gently bring it down, but also bring up other microbes that are going to help keep them in check with prebiotics and food, prebiotic fiber in food. Sometimes we'll recommend prebiotic powders like psyllium husk fiber, or maybe it's partially hydrolyzed guar gum from guar beans. Um, and then we intend to understand, do we need to give you something for motility after that, like ginger or another pro-motility agent, artichoke extract, or something else that supports serotonin production in the gut. And then did these overabundance of microbes cause any barrier issues? Do we need to maybe incorporate more protein into your diet or more protein or amino acids in another way? And do we need to add more of these mucusy foods like okra and aloe and cactus so we can rebuild the walls and then redecorate them with a nice thick layer of mucus once the home is a little bit more in alignment without all these opportunists kind of overrunning the home. So it's figuring out who is at the root, it's balancing them out as necessary, and then really nurturing and repairing the environment so it can continue to be this healthy, happy microbiome that's in great balance. And so we really call this, really the gut microbiome is your inner ecosystem. We say it's the most important ecosystem on this planet, and it's it's your ecosystem. Each one of you have a unique ecosystem inside of you. And really, Dahlia and our other dietitian, Rachel, who really this is their specialty of, of kind of complex GI disorders, <clears throat> IBS and SIBO, they're kind of like they're kind of like gut ecologists in a way, right? Where they're going, they're going, what species out of whack? Who introduced this, you know, snake into this environment? You know, let's kind of capture, relocate. Let's see what damage they've done. Let's repair that damage and then let's replenish, right? And that's a sec mm -hmm. essentially what's going on in the gut. And, and it's doing that with nutrition first and foremost, as and then other modalities and resources just to kind of be that gut ecologist. And then you're you're doing your own thing. I love it when we get portal messages in our in our portal. It's just like a patient going like, I feel amazing. Thank you. It's like, I'm not gonna be following up. Like, I feel great. And we're like, wow, awesome. Like, that's exactly the goal. So we love that. Fantastic. If you hear some funny sounds, it's Daisy having a dream back here. Aww. Oh, yeah. No, we didn't hear. Okay. It was like, <laughs> hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm like, um, but That's if I don't, I shut the door and she'll beg to come in. So I, it's just easier just to let her hang out. So, so cute. Um, did you hear that? Oh, I heard it that time. Yeah. That, there you go. <laughs> oh, Daisy. It's okay, puppy. Um, so typically, so you're treating the SIBO and you get them and you start understanding <laughs> And I really wanted to point out when you were mentioning the the room and then you start redecorating with some yeah. <laughs> mucus. I just like saw like paintings mucus. with mucus and curtains. With mucus. <laughs> wow. Okay. That's a get whole, I love that um, <laughs> illustration. So with that, what is a typical length of 
uh, treatment? Is mm-hmm. there an average, you know, someone needs to be thinking about? Is this weeks, months, years? What are we looking at? Yeah, that's a great question. So usually what we do is first we try to rebalance. So if that's antibiotics or something prescription strength, that's usually a little bit shorter, probably a couple of weeks. If it's an over-the-counter herbal antimicrobial, it could be four to six weeks. And we do that part first. And then we do the diet intervention following that. We don't have people do the diet at the same time that we're trying to rebalance the gut because if we don't give them their preferred food, then they're not as out and about as they could be for us to really capture them with treatment. So after that, we then will recommend a reverse elimination where then we're saying, okay, let's do low FODMAP, low sulfur, low histamine. Sometimes it's a combo of those things and really get you to tolerate larger and larger amounts of fiber and fermentable carbohydrates throughout that time over maybe the span of four weeks if somebody doesn't have really significant symptoms, or maybe it's three months if somebody has more significant symptoms. So we really encourage everyone to really examine how are you feeling going into this? How slowly do we need to take it? Did you come to us and say, I can only eat five different plants right now because my gut is in such disarray? that person's going to take a little bit longer because maybe we're reintroducing half a teaspoon or tablespoon of food at a time until they've really built up their repertoire of different types of foods. But if that somebody else comes to me and they're like, yeah, I'm a little bloated and kind of constipated, but I pretty much eat a wide variety. It doesn't stop me from doing that. I don't have pain after meals. That'll be a lot shorter for that person. Um, So I think it can vary, but I would say anywhere from probably six weeks to maybe upwards of 12 to 16 weeks if somebody really needs it. Mm, Okay. And so I'm curious, do you ever use probiotics like capsule form? Um, Do you have a preferable brand or what do you, when do you recommend those? I, we are so unique and all of us have such unique needs with those helpful microbes. And so I like to use a resource, usprobioticchart.org, and it helps you really identify, okay, if it's, if they're constipated, if they have methane overgrowth, if they have hydrogen overgrowth, what exact species and strain of probiotic is going to be most helpful. And Mm -hmm. so there is, it's hard to really create a blanket. There's a couple different ones that I like. And if somebody has more gut disarray, like inflammatory bowel disease or hydrogen sulfide SIBO, and they just have such a high abundance of inflammatory gut bugs, I'm going to give them a really high amount of helpful gut bugs to try to balance that out. But if somebody has maybe methane IMO, I'm going to be really careful about what strains of probiotic I'm recommending. And maybe it's just 5 billion colony forming units of lactobacillus ruteri. Um, Maybe it's nothing at all because maybe adding more lactic acid bacteria will make someone feel worse and give them relapse. I usually though, will give a blanket recommendation to people of let's make sure you're eating probiotics. So Stanford came out with a really great study a few years ago that showed that those who were eating the most probiotic foods per day, they estimated about four to six servings a day had the most diverse gut microbiome. They had richness in their diversity. So there was not only a a wide diversity of types of gut bugs, but there was a lot of them. And they had a stronger immune system because 70 plus percent of our immune cells are in our gut and something called our gut associated lymphoid tissue. So I give that recommendation. Hey, let's try to get you to eat four to six servings of probiotics a day after we've balanced things out and eat things like tempeh that's not cook to death and miso and drink some kombucha that doesn't have any added sugar. And maybe let's get you some non-dairy yogurt, or let's get you water kefir or another type of fermented probiotic food. Let's get you some veggies that will, that were pickled in brine. And let's make sure you're getting in both that seed of the probiotic in kind of your gut garden and the food that's going to nourish the seed as a prebiotic with it. So that way, when you're really taking care of those seeds very well, then they're going to give you that nice gift, like a flower or a fruit that's called a postbiotic that James was mentioning earlier. So it's absolutely, I'm a big fan of probiotic foods, especially for those who don't eat dairy. I think Mm -hmm. that that's what I see a lot of the times in the plant-based community as well. They say, I felt amazing the first year, year and a half when I cut out dairy. And then my gut started feeling off. 
And oftentimes I'll ask, yes, dairy can, you know, be irritating to the gut. It might make some of your symptoms worse. And it's a, a source of probiotics. So did you replace those probiotic bacteria when you cut out dairy? Most people really, we were just starting to talk about eating probiotics. So most people say no. And once we get them eating more probiotics, they start to feel like, oh, I'm bad. I'm having great bowel movements again. I'm less bloated. I'm having less of that joint pain and fatigue and whatever gut symptoms that I had. So, and, and also getting in the garden, getting mm-hmm. into nature, right? Mm-hmm. Breathing what, what many great doctors and researchers have called breathing your biome, where we are, we are getting exposed to a microbiome from the environment, which is making up a large majority of our inner ecosystem through touching soil. This is where a lot of the research coming out in biofield energy and grounding and being in nature and nature baths. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not just the energy. Yes, the energy is great and there's lots of great research coming out, but it's the micro it's the microbes, right? With every inhale, we're we're inhaling at least 10 fungal spores. So, you know, we're inhaling we're inhaling viruses and fungal spores and bacteria and those are getting into our mouth and we're touching our skin and it may seem like Ugh, to some people, but it's amazing when you're in the correct environment, when you're going for a hike, when you're in the ocean surfing or swimming and you're getting that exposure, that is also extremely powerful, right? When you have a beautiful backyard garden and you're digging with your bare hands and planting native plants and species, you're getting that exposure as well. And I think this is where we're seeing the kind of the rise in raw milk, where a lot of in people on social media are like drink raw milk, drink raw milk. What you're saying is, take in more microbes, which are in raw milk and, and there's risk there. And you're kind of outsourcing going, Hey cow, give me your microbes versus we should be really going moms try to breastfeed please. And and get that raw milk from your actual human mother and get those microbes from so many other great sources. We don't necessarily have to like, just kind of default to like raw milk. We have to have raw milk. It's like, there's so many other great sources to get those microbes from. So Mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of connection there. (laughs) Yeah. That's just great. And, you know, pets are another great source Mm -hmm. of diversity. Um, So question that I get a lot is, you know, they switch to a whole food plant-based diet. They're increasing the fiber dramatically instant increase in gas and some other unpleasant things. Um, What do you suggest for that? Like, is there a food preparation? Um, Do you cut back on certain foods for a certain period of time? Um, Any products that you'd use for that? Like, what do you do? And what typically is a timeline for someone to say, hey, I've been doing this for so long. It's not getting better. Maybe there's something else going on. So how do you address that? I think it's so important to ask, what's the severity of it? Is it mild discomfort? Are you doubled over in pain with gas that's stuck? What amount of fiber were you consuming prior to you going whole food plant-based? Did you go from having that typical, you know, were you the 97% of Americans who weren't reaching that 20, 28 to 35 grams of fiber per day, and now you're eating hundred grams a day. That is a rapid change for your gut bugs. They are, again, now having this expedited um, factory factory, and they're not prepared for it. So slowly, I would say you can increase their workload by maybe increasing five grams of fiber a week. That's like another one type of plant a week Um, and use your resources that you have use your saliva and use your teeth to really chew and break down that fiber in your mouth. We have enzymes that break down starch in our, in our saliva, use your teeth. You would be so surprised how many people are like, yeah, I wasn't chewing well. (laughs) And now that I'm chewing each bite 30 times, I actually do feel better. Um, Well, that goes into like mindful eating really quickly. Like so many of us are eating while we're driving or watching TV or on our phone. And it's like that, that really connects to gut health because if you're not chewing and you already have dysbiosis or you're not getting enough fiber and then on top of that, you're not chewing, that, that is, is massive, mm-hmm. massive. I think so really overlooked. Use those tools. Use your gut, your enzymes in your mouth to chew and break down your food for you. Use your teeth. Use foods that are rich in enzymes like kiwi and pineapple and papaya, ginger, turmeric. Eat those enzyme-rich foods to also help you with digestion. And I will say if you need to, sometimes digestive enzymes can be slightly helpful. If somebody does 
over time really not feel like they're getting better and digesting things. Um, maybe add a little bit of acid, maybe have lemon water when you're eating or add a little bit of vinegar to your meal. So that acid helps with stomach acid production. Um, and I always say, try to only eat while you're eating if you can, so that you're not eating in a distracted state because 30% of our digestive juices are produced before we even eat. It's called the cephalic phase when any of our senses are engaged with food, seeing it, smelling it, hearing it, touching it, tasting it, that is going to help produce 30% more stomach acid and bile to break down the food. So try to really engage with your food in that way where you're not going from working to immediately eating that, you know, DoorDash that got delivered to you and you, you know, maybe missed out on that phase that you could have utilized. Um, and if you're doing those things and you're slowly adding, you're breaking down and you're still in pain, that maybe is a sign that your gut's telling you, hey, this, this workforce is just needing a little bit of help and attention. And that's really when I would say if it doesn't get better in a couple months, two to three months, then that's a sign that maybe you need some help. And then when you see your dietitian realize, oh yeah, I've had my gallbladder removed or my appendix mm. removed, or I've had X, Y, Z issues for 10, 20, 30 years. And that's where you don't even, a lot of people just don't even think about this, right? It's like, oh, what's done is done. There's no way that in the past is affecting me now. And we kind of just bring it back to your health story and going like, no, your gallbladder being gone does have a, a massive effect. It's not like all hope is gone, but it's more of a reason to put more focus and attention into understanding your symptoms currently, into understanding your nutrition lifestyle, because you're missing kind of a key player there. The gallbladder is a key player. And it's kind of like you're missing a little team member there. So the other team members have to work a little bit harder. So you want to provide for them a little bit more, make sure you're you're really on top of it and conscious of what's going on. So little variables like that as well. Absolutely. So, again, I want to be uh, mindful of your time, but one last question that I often get is how many yeah. grams of fiber do you recommend? Because I know what people are, you know, the RDA is recommending this, whatever, whatever. But what is really ideal? Because I find that a lot of the USDA recommendations are very anemic. <laughs> so yeah. I'm curious what you guys are, are finding is ideal for people to maintain a healthy gut. I've, I mean, I'll quickly say, I mean, we love overall the 80-20 of like 80% really great plant foods and 20% animal foods for someone like an, like an average person to shoot towards. And really what that goes towards is uh, almost like a doubling of, of the current recommendations mm -hmm. for the average person. But then we love, like we've been hundred percent plant-based for 13 years mm -hmm. and there's some days we track and I know I get closer to almost triple the recommendations and it's mm -hmm. like, and then that, that works for me, but I've been doing this a while. So mm -hmm. I don't know if you, I mean, but those, those are goals, right? So again, it's, it's where are you mm -hmm. as the individual and then working your way towards that. But I would say a kind of a doubling at least of the current recommendations is an easy kind of standard and goal for the, for most people to shoot for. And then their timeline will differ for how long it takes them to get there. Because yeah, I think seasoned, you know, plant-based vets, like the three of us, we could easily eat 75 to hundred grams of fiber a day because mm -hmm. that's what our diet consists of. And it has, and we've trained our guts in that way, but somebody who's maybe a newbie and they're coming off of a standard American diet, maybe the RDA is a huge goal for them where they're yeah. like, oh my gosh, 28 grams a day, I'm a female or 30, 35 grams a day as a male. That is a lot for me because right now I'm eating six. Um, mm -hmm. So it's just going at their pace, but absolutely. I, I would tend to agree if we're really recommending trying to get about half of at least lunch and dinner coming from fiber or more or uh, non-starchy vegetables and fruits um, that will be around probably 50 plus grams per day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just going at your pace to try to get there. And, you know, we love to say heal with each meal. And mm -hmm. that is our tagline mm -hmm. at Married to Health. That's what we encourage every single person to do. We believe that you can heal with each meal. And we also like to recommend to feel with each meal. So mm -hmm. you can heal with each meal. So it's really assessing what got me here, what's going to get me to that goal, what is my goal, and then who's going to be my helper along the way. I need a great primary care doctor. Let me reach out to Dr. Marbas. I'm looking for a gut health dietitian. I need this other person to be part of my guide to get myself there to this goal that I have. 
Well, I think that's all great. So what a great way to end a wonderful conversation is heal with each meal and feel mm -hmm. with each meal. So I think that's fantastic. I do know I will be sending people your way. I certainly have a little, a few already thinking that might be super <laughs> helpful to engage with you. Um, yeah, because I, I think it's nice. It's like you're a specialist, right? And so we each have our place and, and, uh, I always learn by having conversations and I really want to thank you guys for sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us today. This was fantastic. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, I love thank it. Thank you for this. Yeah. And we're so grateful to get to collaborate and refer patients to one another. It makes it so, so, so helpful when their primary provider is just in the know and on board. Excellent. So where can people, we'll put the links, but where can people find you if they're listening only? Yeah, marriedtohealth.com. And uh, you can find us at Married to Health on all social media platforms, Instagram, uh, YouTube. And if you go to marriedtohealth.com, we highly recommend uh, signing up for our email list. And we're going to be dropping, or I'll let you kind of. Yeah, we have our uh, Good Gut SIBO IBS course coming out in the next mm -hmm. couple months as well. We had launched it a few years ago. We've taken it down. We've highly added to it and really revamped it. So that will be Refined coming out for, for sure. absolutely and just really made it more robust for those who want that help and whether they want one-on-one -on -one. and of course, that's great. If they do want that one-on-one -on -one help, they can find me. They can find our other six, five other dietitians yeah. on our website if they need somebody to help with oncology or metabolic disease or emotional release. We have an emotional release dietitian. We have a pediatric dietitian and all of us are plant-based, integrative, and all have that heal with each meal at heart. So it's a one-stop shop. I love it. So yeah. um, check it out, guys, marriedtohealth.com and definitely follow our Instagram. You guys have great stuff there. Um, so thank you again and um, definitely want to have you back on. I'd love to dive in to some other interesting topics like when people find relief with a carnivore type diet why mm -hmm. is that how mm -hmm. is that related so some really interesting because those again questions people get or post and i'm sure you've had them yourself yes so, excellent yeah. well thanks again everyone and thanks Thank for listening you. and uh we'll be back